Thank you, Elizabeth. And I want to thank Andrea Perales for introducing me into, well, uh, introducing me to Elizabeth. And I want to thank all of you for being here today. And for our Zoom friends, thank you very much for joining us through Zoom. I'm going to start with a quote, um, if I can get my, a quote from C.S. Lewis that says, Hardships often prepare ordinary people for extraordinary destinies. Well, I'm not one that has an extraordinary destiny, but I have had an extraordinary life, and I want to share with you uh, how hardships helped me to overcome uh, some of my early insecurities and also helped me to overcome my desire to please everyone. To do that, I am going to have to take you on a little journey uh, back to my hometown. And the fastest way to get you there is to jump in a wormhole and uh, go back to a little town in northern Mexico that has, that at the time I was growing up, had no electricity. And if you'll get your spacesuits on, we will take the exit at Casas Grandes, Chihuahua. Now, Chihuahua is a state to the south of uh, Texas, and it is mostly desert landscape, but um, the area that I came from was actually in the foothills of the Mexican Rocky Mountains. And the, um, I was born in El Paso, Texas, because at that time, a lot of people went from the area, the rural area in Mexico that we were in, uh, to the US to have their children because there weren't good doctors or good clinics or hospitals. So it was either a home birth or go to El Paso or somewhere else in the US. It also gave me dual citizenship, which I am very grateful for. Um, and there were four communities where I grew up. Two of them were Mexican, and I came from the smallest one of those and two of them were Mormon, uh, people that had left Utah and settled in northern Mexico. And I attended the Mormon school, and that's why I speak the English that I do. And um, I had a rather idyllic childhood. Um, I rode horses, I mean, you name it. I just had a wonderful childhood and teen years, too. And then, um, um, let me quickly say that um, that's an old house, but that's not my house in Casas Grandes. I'm not quite that old yet. Um, and those are the Pakime Indian ruins that were a mile from where I grew up. And I like them because that's where the miniature dog, the little chihuahua, comes from. The ancestors of those dogs came from Pakime archeological site. And um, the little town that I grew up in, Casa Grandes, I lived a block away from that house. And suddenly, at age 16, my idyllic childhood and teen years came to a stop. My father, you can't see that very well, but he went bankrupt. And it left me with terrible emotional scars, and not just me, my mother and my siblings, because people that we thought had been our friends suddenly turned their back on us and I couldn't understand it. It um, gave me a lot of insecurities, let me, let me put it that way. And it also pushed me into an early marriage. My father was a cattleman, and he had a friend in another state that owned cattle property in uh, the state of Durango, and also happened to own a cattle station in the Northern Territory of Australia. So between the two of them, they decided that um, they would arrange a marriage, that man's son and me. 
But first, they didn't know me, so that I went off to college my first semester in Durango so that the family could meet me and decide if they really wanted me in their family or not. Well, apparently I passed the test because they brought eligible son back, he met me, and we were married six weeks later. Love at first sight, hardly. But I was being pushed very strongly by my father into that marriage, not my mother. She wanted me to finish my studies in the university. I was studying painting in oils. I'd started at age six, and I loved um, artwork and art history. So we flew to um, the territory in Australia, and we landed in, obviously, Darwin, the largest city in the territory. And this is Arnhem Land, uh, the large native Australian reservation. And then where you see the Roper River, um, right there, and it actually goes down this way. It looks like it goes that way. It isn't. It goes that way. The Gulf of Carpentaria, and then the Lemon Bight River. That's where I was headed for obviously the next couple, several years. St. Vigian Station, 2,630 square miles, 600 square miles larger than the state of Delaware in the United States. And we had honeymooned in um, San Francisco, Hawaii, Fiji, Tokyo, Sydney, and then I arrived in paradise. <laughs> I know you can't see it very well, and that's probably just as <laughs> well that you can't see it too well. Um, the, that's the Roper River back there. It is a tidal river, and it had crocodiles. This is the billabong that we had our drinking water and all the water that we used at the house. And during the monsoon rains, all of that would be one solid sheet of water. And guess what? We had come up right outside our yard, which was fenced. Anybody want to take a guess? Crocodiles, of course. We sighted several of them during, it was in Australia, they call it the wet season. It's the monsoon rains. Um, obviously, um, we did have an airplane, and that was the hangar for the airplane, and this is the landing strip. Those other little houses that you see around there, most of, a couple of them were trailers for the uh, people that worked during the mustering season. That was the house that I lived in. And the mustering season was, uh, lasted seven or eight months, and it was during the dry season. And the men would go out um, to catch wild cattle and take them to market for, to be processed for the um, Japanese market. And I was left alone when the men went mustering. I was left there for three weeks at a time, and they would come back for one week and go out again for three weeks. Um, so I was left with the beautiful and the scary. I think you can quickly see which ones are the beautiful ones. Um, but the scary ones, obviously, water buffalo, the crocodiles, and the snakes. Because 40% of the world's deadliest snakes inhabit that area of Australia. When the men were out mustering, I would have to kill snakes both inside and outside the house. Inside, okay? I had cats and dogs that would help um, identify when there were snakes around. And um, when my son was born in Darwin, I never, never let him crawl. Now, I quickly found out why my husband had taken me as a bride. The ranch needed a cook, a housekeeper, 
an extra ranch hand. That's, uh, that's me at the uh, corral uh, on top of that little, um, that little calf helping out. And they also needed a radio operator because that was our communication with the outside world. And they needed a bookkeeper. I was an artist. I didn't know a thing about bookkeeping. But it was a challenge. But I figured if the ancient Egyptians had figured out accounting 5,000 years before, surely I could figure out the basics of bookkeeping. So I did. So basically what they needed, and I filled the role, uh, was an administrative manager at the homestead. At the time, I didn't even realize that I was doing all of that. Really, it was just like, okay, one more thing to do. Um, amongst the duties that I had were to order all of the supplies that the ranch needed um, for two months at a time. All of the supplies, if we needed hammers and nails or we needed food, I was the one that had to order it. So, um, so therefore, um, I would place an order every two months and it would be delivered. Well, one time I made a mistake. I forgot to order toilet paper. And we were almost out. We went for two months with no toilet paper. But we did have magazines. Thank God. I never made that mistake again. Uh, my closest neighbors were 36 miles away in Arnhem Land. It was the Roper River Settlement. And an airplane would fly to different outposts and Roper River was one of them, a commercial, uh, small commercial airline, and bring passengers and bring the mail. And when the men were gone, I always had to do that by myself, go up once a week and get, um, and get the mail. So I would have to take the motorboat from the billabong, haul it up, put it in the river, cross over, get the mail, come back. And, um, you know, I guess it made me pretty strong at the time. I don't know. I mean, it wasn't, I never thought about it, but I, I'm sure I got a little bit, you know, strong. Um, I also, one time, and of course the men were away, the water pump broke down, and I was not going to carry buckets of water from the billabong up to the house. So I fixed the pump. I wasn't a mechanic, I was just a painter. That was what I kept telling myself then. But I learned how to do it. Now, what does all of this have to do with business leadership or any kind of leadership? It had a lot to do with it because I had to learn all sorts of skills that are very useful in business. I was basically managing a business without knowing it. I'd learned bookkeeping. I handled all of those records. I learned how to do budgeting. I learned how to do planning. Remember the toilet paper story? I learned how to do planning. And um, I had to learn how to be creative in my thinking. So I, uh, you know, you can't fix a pump, especially an old dilapidated one, if you don't think creatively. And also I had to learn about teamwork because I was the only woman on 2,630 square miles and there were anywhere from two to um, 15 men that came in to work. And so I had to be part of that team. I had to be. Um, it would have been miserable if I hadn't been. And then the ranch was sold and we moved to my ex-husband's uh, state of Durango, where we were going to manage a movie set and movie rental business for my former father-in-law. And though a lot of westerns were made there, you can tell from the western street. I'm up there with a couple of uh, stuntmen, 
And I was responsible for all of the inventory. So if a movie set required a horse at 11 o'clock, I had to make sure that that horse was saddled and ready there. And of course, I had a couple of people that worked with me that did all of that. Um, Harry Belafani and Sidney Potay made a, a film while I was there. And uh, again, that's me, but you can't really see me with Harry Belafonte and then Harry with his daughter. Um, we suddenly had a lot of friends that would come around and they wanted to meet the big stars, especially people like Anne Margaret and John Wayne. And they were always shocked to find out that Wayne was bald and actually had to use a hairpiece for, um, for his filming. I served as um, Chris Christopherson's and uh, Anne Margaret's and John Wayne's and several other people's Spanish English interpreter. I did all the translating that the film scripts required for the Mexican crews. And whatever they needed in painting, I also painted. At that time, I was still pretty much self-taught. And that is a life-size nude that Michael Wayne ordered for one of his father's uh, bar scenes. And um, that's a picture that I took before, obviously before I turned it over to them. And um, so you're probably wondering, you went from the isolation of Australia and now you're meeting all these interesting people. Why do you talk about an ex-husband? Well, it's real simple. There were a lot of starlets running around that um, thought that my ex-husband would launch them to stardom because he had something to do with the, with the film stock people. And the other little bit was that he started partying a lot and drinking heavily, and he became very violent when he drank. And he usually took it out on me. And I decided that I was not going to be a battered wife. But it took the day that he struck our son for the first time that I said, I'm out of here. He wanted to split custody. He wanted um, six months with him and six months with me. And I decided that um, that would not go. So I negotiated. And I told him to keep all the money that we had made in the sale of the cattle station in Australia, which was considerable money, and I would take our son, full custody of our son. I left with two suitcases, with um, including the slides that, that I had digitalized just for this presentation. Unfortunately, they, they don't show up very well because they're so old. Um, and I left with $200 in my pocket. Now remember, I did have U.S. citizenship because I'd been, um, um, I had dual citizenship. And I was scared out of my wits when I left Durango. But I also thought, I'm starting a new life. My son and I are going to the United States. And at that time, hardly any, there were hardly any illegal people in the, in the U.S. So I get to the border to be turned away, even though I'm a U.S. citizen, because I'm trying to bring my Australian-born son in with me. And the laws at that time in the US did not allow for that. Well, I didn't have the money to hire an attorney, but I asked to plead my case. And the officer who heard me said, you know, you know it's just impossible. You, you need to, you know, you're wasting our time. You can't do this. And, um, I had the choice of either going back to my husband or try to plead my case a little bit harder. And at one point, he said, take your dark glasses off. We're in, inside. And when I took them off, he saw my black eye. He wanted to know what had happened. I told him the story, and he declared it a humanitarian situation, and my son and I were across legally that afternoon. I found it ironic that I was trying to do it legally and that I came across such a huge challenge, but um, 
I have no regrets about that whatsoever. Um, when I got to the US, of course, I had two skills. I could paint. Uh, that little chair is a painting that I still have. And I could interpret and translate. But the first four years were financially very difficult because all I could find was clerical work. And then the fourth year out, I found a job at the federal courthouse interpreting and translating in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And that paid well enough that I could return to the university and finish off my uh, fine arts and art history degree. And after I completed that, I could not find a job teaching. So I decided I'd go back to the university, and I enrolled in the MBA program at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And after the third tax season, I thought I would slit my wrists if I had to do another tax return. So I see one of my CPA friends over here <laughs> nodding his head. Um, I, um, they say that accountants never retire. They simply recalculate. Well, I was too young, obviously, to retire, nor did I have the money. So I reinvented myself, and I got a job with Johnson & Johnson in the internal audit department. My son was graduating from high school, so I could have a job that would take me traveling, another one of my dreams. And I was there for several years, and then one day they came in and they offered me the CFO position at Johnson Johnson, Mexico. I was the third person that offered it to. The first two very wisely turned it down because the Mexican affiliate was going bankrupt. And when they offered it to me, I said, fantastic, when do I leave? I knew I was going back to my own country. I was going back to Mexico. I realized that I was going to a very macho culture. It still was in the 90s, still very macho. And when I got there, all of the employees were very demoralized. They thought I had come down to close the company completely. Um, what I did find was that um, a very inefficient manufacturing plant. So I started importing product from the US and, um, and from Puerto Rico. And once I had that up and going, I closed down the manufacturing plant, had to lay off 1,600 people, which was the hardest thing I had to do. Believe me, I got sick after I did it. I, it was devastating to me. But I had to do it if I was going to save the company. So um, now, I was the highest ranking woman that Johnson Johnson had in Latin America at that time. So I sold the plant and the administrative offices, moved us to rented space, and um, then sold, of course, the plant and the and, um, administrative offices. And with that, I used the money to pay off US dollar-based debt. And the money that was left over, and it, there was quite a bit of money left over, I was going to use to rebuild the company. So I had to hire a couple of people to in, in uh, information technology. And we, uh, my teams and I sat down, and we did strategic planning. And then we um, bought a mainframe computer and personal computers for everybody at the company. They had never had personal computers at the company. So I had to train everybody. Of course, I wasn't going to do it myself. I hired a couple of trainers. First day of training, I get there all excited. The trainers arrive, and no employees that are scheduled for training arrive. They still think that the company's going to be closed down, despite you know, the, what they could see happening. I called my managers, and I don't remember what I told them, but whatever it was could not be repeated here today. They got all of the employees that were scheduled for that day there within 15 minutes. <laughs> And that was the turning point in the company. They realized I was serious. 
Then a recession comes along, and if we had not paid off the dollar-based debt, then uh, we would have been in trouble. That would have bankrupted us. Um, and then five years after I arrived, we won the Johnson & Johnson Signature Quality Award, which was a really big deal in the J&J &J world. Um, from there, I went to Argentina as CFO, discovered fraud, uh, confirmed it, informed corporate, they fired the general manager and three other people. My five years in Argentina were phenomenal. It is an incredibly beautiful country. And an economic recession hit. Well, they seem to be following me everywhere. So then I was named uh, VP of Finance for Latin America and the Caribbean. And guess what happened? Almost all the countries were falling into a serious economic recession. Argentina was starting to recover. Mexico had recovered. Um, Venezuela, unfortunately, has never recovered. Um, so I decided after almost four years in that position that if I retired, surely the economic recessions would stop. <laughs> Seriously, the reason I took an early retirement was that I had other goals, and I wanted to, um, to pursue them. And um, so that is basically the story of how I went from basically a housewife, obviously, to um, a VP of finance for a major multinational corporation. And, um, I could not have done it without the lessons in the Outback, those basic leadership management skills that I learned, the creativity, forming teamwork, um, and being able to identify problems and anticipate problems. And, um, and I cannot emphasize enough about teamwork. That was key to everything that I did. It really was. Um, I was only there to guide people um, through to the quality award that we won. Um, and turning the company around in Mexico got rid of a lot of my insecurities that had happened when my father went bankrupt. It just, it was amazing. It was just like they went up in smoke and just disappeared. And now I'm writing mystery thrillers. And how did I turn all of these hardships um, around? By never giving up, never, never giving up. And also, along the way, I had learned to say no, to stay focused and get the job done. Don't take it from me. Um, Warren Buffett says that very successful people say no to almost everything. And in the area of innovation, Steve Jobs said that innovation is about saying no to a thousand great ideas. I want to take just a minute to talk about my writing. I'm not a literary writer. I'm not Shakespeare, I write mystery thrillers, and I love what I do. And the first book, Waking Up in Medellin, is set in Colombia, and I created a uh, protagonist, her name is Nikki Garcia, and she is a fraud auditor. Nikki Garcia is not me. Like John Grisham, who's an attorney and writes about lawyers, I was a former fraud auditor that created a fraud auditor. By uh, that book won Best Fiction Book of the Year in 2017 at the Killer Nashville International Mystery Writers Conference. And it's been translated into Spanish. It will be coming out in late March, probably. Uh, the next book, Danger in the Coyote Zone. By then, Nikki Garcia has become a private investigator, and that book is about human trafficking of minors. It is um, a dark topic, 
but it's not a terribly dark, it's not a dark book. And I am quoting my friend Nancy Miller in those words. Thank you, Nancy, for having said that. Um, it is not a dark book. And then, um, Wake, um, Revenge in Barcelona, uh, which is the one on the far right, um, that one just won in its category first place at Latino Books into Movies. So I'm, we're very, very pleased about that. That's my latest book. The fourth, Nikki Garcia, is missing in Miami, and that one will be out probably at the end of this year, first part of next year. And um, the one on the far right, Colonel's Dilemma, that's also in development. That's a standalone book about a mathematical genius, a young girl in Mexico. And the middle book, um, Backyard Volcano, won Best Short Story Collection in 2018 at Killer Nashville. So you see, I've been having a lot of fun. And I'm also happy to see that there are other authors in this, uh, in this group today. Elizabeth asked me to bring some books in case any of you want to, to buy some. They are on special price today because of this event. And my husband, my wonderful husband, who is very supportive, Bob Hurt, and by the way, it is our seventh anniversary today. <laughs> I am a firm believer that if we really work for things, we really get them. And um, it proves that I waited a long time, but I'm in a happy marriage. Um, he will take cash, he will take credit cards, and he'll probably take Bitcoin too. So if you want any, that's fine, uh, any books. You can also take my card because my website address is there, and I do write a monthly blog about my adventures in Australia. And uh, they're short, they're you know, about 400 words, not 400 pages, 400 words. And, um, and they go in more deeply into some of the adventures that I had in Australia. So um, now it is time for me to bring you back to the woodlands after this long trip. Well, whoops, I went back, sorry. Um, so I <laughs> need to bring you back to the woodlands and we'll drop you off at the pavilion. And George Mitchell and two of his grandchildren are there to welcome us back. Thank you very much. This has been a wonderful experience for me, and I hope that you've enjoyed it. Thank you all. Any questions? Okay. Yes, yes. You count this, right? Right. You're responsible for it. Lions, tigers, snakes, bears. Do you ever get frustrated? You ever think, can I do this? I mean, that's got to be overwhelming, right? It was overwhelming at times, but you know, I never looked at it that way. Uh, there were times that I was down and depressed a little bit about being by myself. I mean, all of us who have lived through this last year know that it can be a real downer to be so isolated. But let me tell you, I didn't have tigers, okay? Would have loved tigers, but didn't have any. <laughs> um, the way I looked at it, and the way I had to look at it, that it was an adventure. And that I had made a commitment to get married, and I was going to definitely give it my best. And I did. I did. So, any other questions? Did, did you have one? No? Anybody else? You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Elizabeth. So much.